Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Gagno Atelier. I'm your old pal, Tim Gagno, and this is the Modern Masters Podcast. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. We are broadcasted live from Gulf Coast State College Education Encore Program. So I'm going to put my mask on. There we go. Got to save the world and protect ourselves, right? We got to be smart here. And so that's what we're doing. And uh, once again, I look like I'm a superhero who is about to save democracy as we know it. I'm pretty excited about that. But uh, what I'm going to do, and I hope that you can do uh, for us, is if you could like and share this broadcast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to my Facebook page and I am going to like this broadcast and I'm going to share it. Let's see if I can do that. This is always exciting. And uh, let's see, how do we share this? There we go. Right there it is. And so I'm looking on my phone right here and I find the broadcast right there and I hit the share button and there it goes. We go ahead and we share that just like that. And it has been shared. And so it is on my Facebook page and everybody in the world can see it. So we hope that you do that as well. Uh, go ahead and uh, go on the Gagno Atelier Facebook page if you're watching that. Or you can go on our YouTube channel. We've got a great YouTube channel with over 35 Modern Masters podcasts where we have interviewed some of the most amazing artists in the world today. And you can check those out by going and searching on YouTube, Gagno Atelier. So with that said, guys, I just want to go on here and tell you about our sponsor that we have. Uh, if you've seen any of our opening graphics that you like, those fancy uh, graphics that we have, uh, those were done by uh, my friends over at Edge Digital Agency. And so I'm going to show you a little commercial that they have put because they've got a special offer for you. So here we go. Hey, guys, this is Judah with Edge Digital Agency. We want to offer something special to the friends and family of Gagno Atelier, our digital diagnostic. In this free consultation, we equip you with the tools and strategies you need to maximize your online impact. For example, your website needs to wow customers and serve them well, but it also needs to rank high on search engines like Google, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Visit us today at edgedigital.agency, and when you reach out, make sure to mention that you saw us on one of Tim's videos. Thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to hearing from you. Oh boy, that's exciting. Edge Digital Agency, or it's actually, no, I was going to say .com, but it's actually edgedigital.agency. Who knew there was a .agency? Boy, the internet changes every day, but there's a dot agency. That just, for some reason, that gets me excited. I don't know why. But uh, anyway, guys, check them out. They've got a great offer for you. Just let them know your old pal Tim sent you. All right. With that said, guys, we have got an awesome, awesome, awesome guest today. I met her uh, in the uh, early 2000s. Can't tell you the exact date for some reason, but uh, I met her at the Modenaro Street Art Festival uh, that was hosted by the Visual Arts Center, which is now the Panama City Center for the Arts. Uh, and we did a street, uh, street painting, street talk festival uh, over at uh, a local outside mall called Pier Park. And I uh, met her and uh, I got to uh, watch her draw and I got to do a little street piece of art right next to her. And uh, so I am excited to have her on. And here we go. There she is, Tracy Lee Stum. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Tim. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Applause. You got an actual round of applause. The, the, be <laughs> the benefits of a live audience is, wow. is, is super, super nice. And uh, that, that's pretty, pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Do you get do you get the do you get the rounds of applause very often when you're on when you're on a Zoom meeting? <laughs> Never. My cat's usually trying to annoy me while I'm talking to someone in Zoom. So oh, that <laughs> that's, would be about, great. that's about it. <laughs> well, we won't be phased if your cats jump in your lap on this show. We've had we've had dogs do it to many of our guests, and it's it's a normal thing around here. So that is that is good. So um, we met 
quite a while ago. Um, we were talking before the show, the, the early 2000s. And so that was a long, long time ago. Now, you are a street painter uh, and you use pastels. Right. And you also paint now, too, as well on, 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 on the ground sometimes, too. Yep. I think that you use paint. Yep. Uh, and you are, you guys are going to blow, I'm ready to blow, blow my uh, book of world records holder for the largest. Ever. I saw that. I saw that on your website. Is that, is that correct? It's actually, actually, I'm a former Guinness world record holder. The record had been broken, um, but I held it. I held it for quite a while. So that was really fun. And um, just, you know, I was honored that that actually even happened. So um, wow. just a, a great memory for me, for mm. sure. And how big was it? It was 35 feet by 17 and a half feet of chalk pastel on um, actually on a, a fabricated surface that I created. And um, because it was a Guinness World Record for an individual, I couldn't have anyone help me or assist me on that. So that was quite the project. It took me about a month to draw the image um, after getting the panels and everything together. And I have to say the craziest part of it was working on the tablecloth. It was Da Vinci's The Last Supper. And it took me about a week to do this white tablecloth. Oh my God. I'll never forget the tablecloth. It was, it was insane. Oh man. But, See me, I would have just drawn like a really long snake, <laughs> a really skinny one. Actually, yeah, right. Snake on black background, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah just a long <laughs> snake. Not even a black background, just a long snake. Maybe a worm. <laughs> you know, something like that. That, that would have been that would have been my choice. So yeah, now, I, I, maybe maybe I better think about that for the next one. There you go. There you go. If you're going for a record, just go for a worm. Just paint a worm. That's hilarious i kill me i got a million of them i gotta tell you but um now when, when we were there you had painted when we met um you were like the the, the guest artist that the um that the uh museum brought in to paint for our street truck fest i had never even heard of uh street art and montanaro and um so, so they had to explain it to me and um but you were painting i want to say it was it was like an Alice in Wonderland image. And I was painting like a dinosaur dig. I made it look like a, like, like uh, fossils in the ground. And there were people all over, uh, different artists that were painting. And the beauty of that was is that I, I am good friends with pretty much everybody there now. And I had never met any of them. But uh, when you're sitting there drawing on your hands and knees on concrete all day for two days, that just brings you together, you know, because of the agony. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the shared experience, the agony, the agony yeah. and the ecstasy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the back, the, the back, and the broken knees, <laughs> and and the fingers that are just ground down to nothing. So you have been doing street art for how long? Oh my goodness, since um, 1998. Oh wow. Okay. So yeah, 22 have, years now. Do you have artificial knees or? <laughs> Not yet. I'm. I've certainly worn out enough uh, knee pads and gardening pads over the years. So I probably should be a spokesperson for one of those companies. Oh, they should totally but, be sponsoring you. Yeah, absolutely. They right. should totally be sponsoring you. <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, no, it's yeah. It does get harder as you get older. The physicality is intense. Mm. So I keep. Um, my chiropractor, physical therapist, and and masseurs in business <laughs> on a regular bet. basis. <laughs> do a lot of, I'm sure you do a lot of stretching and yoga and other things because that is, you know, I did it. I've done it twice. We did it two years in a row, and uh, yeah, the um, it, it. I was amazed, and I was a young, much younger man then, and I was like, wow, this is brutal, brutal <laughs> on the knees and everything else. But it was so much fun. You know, pastels by themselves are just super fun. But yeah, I uh, agree. So what exactly, why do they call it Modernaro? Maybe that's a question that, that, that you can answer for us because that a lot of people are like, why do you call it that? You know, it sounds like the Madonna and it that, there's a hint, but tell us a little bit about why they call it Modernaro 
and what the history behind street art is a little bit. Sure. Yeah, the history is very interesting. It's um, an art form that, well, we don't really know where it originated because I've done research uh, over the years in my world travels and have found that many cultures actually have this, oh, excuse me, I just lost my hair pack. Um, many cultures have this uh, uh, tradition in their, in their history, in their art history. So drawing on the street has not, is nothing new, but we call the art form Modenaro or Modenari because the Italians actually took the art form and elevated it to a very high level. They, uh, they, some of the history from Italy says that, um, you know, back in the Baroque era or previous to that, the Renaissance era, there were a lot of public festivals. Um, and they were sponsored by, you know, the church and other organizations. So people would come out and they make these elaborate sets and create these um, artistic kind of representations for the festival. And some of that included drawing on the street. So uh, they, they started out by doing that. And then as the art form developed over the years, there were um, artists who continued this tradition and they were known to be painting images of the Madonna and Christian religious themed pieces mm -hmm. as an homage to uh, maybe a prayer or um, a way to give thanks uh, for anything that was going on in the world at that time. And certainly during the wars, this was very important because the soldiers that would come home from fighting, this is what I've heard over the years, that would come home from fighting, they would actually make these devotional pieces on the ground as a thank you to the Madonna. Oh, wow. So um, it was, you know, the, the history of that can be, you can research this and find out it's online mm -hmm. um, and read up different stories about it. But uh, mainly it's because these artists were drawing devotional images and that's why they call them Madanari. Modern, that, that means the plural form of Madanaro or Madanara. And so now we have these Madanari festivals and um, some of them, certainly the one in Italy, there's a big one in Grazie di Cortatone, which is uh, in Northern Italy near Mantova. They uh, require you to draw a Christian religious themed piece in their festival. Um, many of the, most of the festivals in the United States, in fact, I think all of them are um, a little bit more uh, open in that you can draw any themed piece. Mm -hmm. But over the years, the street painting world has, has kind of moved away from the term Madanari. And um, many of the festivals in the U.S. now just call it street painting or chalk art festival. Right. Right. And so that, that, that's a really neat little history lesson, though, for it, because it, it is when you hear Montanaro, people are like, what, what, what do you mean? You know, like, what does Madonna have to do with this? And they're probably thinking the singer, not, not the Virgin Mary. You know? right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, welcome to the two thousands, you know, but, um, it's, uh, it is, it is quite an interesting history. I'm all, you know, I'm a big fan of art history and, and it's always great to learn about the history of these art forms. And it is taken off, uh, in, in huge ways. You know, if it's, when you go online, if you're, if you're playing on Instagram, there are so many images of street art and street street chalk festivals and everything else and they've become such a beautiful thing making it um amazing level now you've you have done this all over the world and uh you have had uh some pretty big clients uh disney uh there there's some images of you uh painting uh in uh in disney and doing all kinds of disney characters and and, and different places um, who are some of the other other big clients that, that you have done street art for? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, some of the more memorable ones have been the um, Winter Olympics. Yep. I did that back in 2010. I've also street painted at the Super Bowl, which was a blast. <laughs> um, I have worked with companies like Sony, Honda, um, you know, uh, um, 20th Century Fox. I mean, you you name it. In the in, I'd say the communications, entertainment, sports industries. I've worked with many many clients: Cadillac, Buick, lots of car um, uh, manufacturers, auto manufacturers, and um, 
gosh, sports teams. Anyway, it's just been a wild ride for sure. Right, right. Now, and, and when when they hire you and you come in, you do some pretty amazing stuff. I've got some pictures of uh, some of the art that you've done, so people can see it. And uh, I'll, I'm going to bring these images up. Just just take a moment and, and uh, tell us a little bit about them. And uh, we'll start with this one because I just think it's it's awesome. Look at that! Look at that! <laughs> That's great. That yeah, that's one of my newer pieces. Actually, that's the most recent chalk drawing that I've done that was done this year. And I did that for a virtual chalk festival. Because of uh, the pandemic, most of the chalk festivals have been canceled this year. But this was for the Santa Barbara e Modinari Festival. Uh, th th that festival is still, you know, holding to the tradition. And it's been running for, oh, my goodness, I can't remember, but it's in the mid thirties, like 35 or 36 years. Oh, wow. And uh, so this, this piece was done actually at the Santa Barbara Zoo. I was able to um, be assigned a sponsor who was, who was um, affiliated with the zoo. And so they, they got the zoo to okay me to come there and draw in, in lockdown, which was great. We were isolated. We weren't near anyone. The zoo was closed to the public. And um, they gave us a fantastic little plaza to work on. My husband helped, my husband Shayek helped me. And uh, the two of us just spent, you know, three days up there drawing and it was just spectacular. So mm. this piece represents the animals of the zoo. They have some pretty unique animals there, but um, you know, they're representing California. They're California cool. They've got their sunglasses on. They're ready to enjoy summer, and they've got their chalk sticks out. They're going to start drawing. So it's my way of staying inspired and keeping people inspired about what we're doing. Even though the, the crowds couldn't come, we were able to share it online on Facebook and Instagram, and um, it was a huge hit, actually, for the Santa Barbara e Modinari. So very grateful for that opportunity. Awesome. And anytime you can have a giraffe with a pair of sunglasses on is a good day. <laughs> You know, I tell this joke all the time, but my, I have friends that will, they'll, they'll call me up and they'll vent about their day and they're like, Oh my day, oh, my boss, blah, 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 blah. And then they'll be like, Oh, I'm sorry, Tim, I've been venting. How was your day? And I'm always like, you're going to get angry. You're going to get angry. And they're like, no, no, no. Tell me how your day was. I'm sorry for venting so much. And I'm like, well, I drew a pineapple on a surfboard today. And they're like, shut up. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> like I told you, I told you, you know, you're the one that wanted to be an accountant. You know, it's like, you know, and so we, we you get to draw giraffes and gorillas and flamingos wearing sunglasses. It's a good three days. It is definitely a good three days. Good three days. So now, this is obviously it's three dimensional. It looks like you're sitting on top of them and they're all work. Amazing three-dimensional pictures. I'm going to show some more so that people can really see it. Here's, here's another one. Now, this obviously has a sponsor as well. Uh, this is yep. uh, this is Sobe, oh the drink. Yes, it is. Uh-huh. And so tell us about this one. Isn't that cool? Well, <laughs> this, was, um, this was actually done in Chicago on the pier out there, and it was part of a four-painting, uh, three-painting tour that I was hired to uh, create artwork for. So they moved their campaign around four different cities in the U.S. And my team and I uh, went to each city and we drew a painting for Sobe. And it was a fantastic project. I had a lot of fun on that one. We were, each piece was unique and represented a different flavor for Sobe beverages. And oh, this one okay. is, you know, Southeast Asia. I think it had dragon fruit in it and some other exotic flavors, um, vanilla and and uh, so we just created this piece where people could look like they're stepping into, you know, um, something from maybe Angkor Wat or a, a South Asian uh, ruins and find their Sobe while they're adventuring. That so uh, fantastic. And, and it, you know, <laughs> it, it looks like, you know, it's like a, something out of Indiana Jones, you know, she's going to fall down there. And it's really neat. People, people just go bonkers with joy over, over this type of art. And you always see them, you know, standing over it and, and doing this. And it is quite a challenge. I'm going to show two guys. Now this next one is, I love this painting that you've done. Um, 
this is two dudes just totally messing around with your art. And it's just so cool. This shows you why street art is the best. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, that's actually my husband in the back there, uh, ah. hanging on to the other gentleman. <laughs> so he's a great willing model. There you and, go. Um, and, uh, you know, he helps me with my paintings and uh, when he has time. So we have a lot of fun. But this this piece was a hoot because I did this one in um, Dubai, actually, for a du Dubai Canvas, had a street painting festival there several years ago. And um, so this piece uh, is a little different from my normal format in that I had people laying down on the floor. So that you're actually looking at the floor piece. And then that panel in the back is like a backdrop or a wall that I created for that. So this is abseiling on the Burj Khalifa, which is one of the tallest buildings in the world. And um, I've got my, these two uh, models or participants are hanging off the side of that building. It looks like they're, they're gonna, if they let go, they're gonna fly down to the bottom of that thing. Right. So, so um, it was a big hit with the locals. Everyone had a great time playing on that painting. Yeah. Did you let just anybody lay down on it like that or just these two? Oh yeah, no, we, I mean, once I'm done, it's, it's kind of like I um, release the painting to the public and then the public can just do whatever they want as far as interaction goes in photography. So um, it's really a lot of fun for me to see what people come up with as far as the interaction, you know, they're very creative. Right. And, um, you know, some people were jumping off of this one. Some people were like hanging on to the groups of like six, you know, um, just a lot of fun. And I really get a lot of enjoyment out of, out of allowing, uh, my work to be a backdrop for people to play. Right. And, and that, 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 that's part of the joy of, of the street festival is watching people's reaction. Um, um, you know, back at, Pier Park, you know, years ago when I was painting and you were behind me, you know, watching people just run up and just look at what are you doing? And they get, they would just flip out. People would just flip out. And, uh, you know, I, I did enjoy it at, at, at that particular mall the most because there were just so many people. It was just insane how many people came out that day uh, to watch and just, well, they were already shopping. We just surprised them that we were there. But um, it, it must be it must be probably the best part of your job is watching people react to your artwork and play on it. So that that's really it is. Cool. It's now, the, this is the part that brings me the most joy. You know, it's um, I try to photograph people that are playing and and stick around for as long as I can. Sometimes I can't stick around for very long, but um, I know that once I leave, it's still there for their enjoyment. So. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. the part that is very magic for me. Yeah, it really is. There's something about, you know, the way people react to art and the way art brings people together that, that that's so great. Now, you use pastels and you use paint. Now, now this one was it paint or pastels? That one was actually painted. Okay. But um okay, so here's another thing that I do with my work is because of the location and the um, maybe limited time that we have on site, I often will create the piece in my studio and then digitally reproduce it as a print. So that piece in the back, the wall piece, was done with chalk pastel in my studio, and then I photographed it and had it reproduced as a print so I could ship it to Dubai very easily. Oh, right. Because we only had limited time there, and I had to spend all the time that I was there working on the floor piece here. I, I actually that. did two paintings at that ca at that festival. So one was live, and this one was partial live and partial print. Amazing! That that that's really interesting. Well, how does she seal it, Tim? So yeah. people don't get chalk all over yeah. the way down. Oh well, now the the bo is the bottom part chalk or is it paint? It's paint. It's paint. Yeah. So the bottom is yeah. paint. Okay, so that's how mm -hmm. they don't get chalk all over them when they lay so down on it. Uh, yeah, that was a problem early on. You know, I was, I was creating these chalk pieces that weren't really meant for interaction. But then I started thinking, well, hmm, I really want some interaction. So how can I do this? So I started designing paintings where people could step in without actually stepping on the chalk. And that um, that was working definitely for a while. So I'd be like, okay, you have to stand on these spots or step in this way. 
-hmm. But after a while, when I had people wanting to roll around on the painting, right. <laughs> I went over to the paint. Yeah. Right. What kind of paint do you use when you do that? I just use an artist acrylic paint okay. usually, and um, you know any good quality paint will work very well. Mm -hmm. um, I've also used some house paint as well for bigger pieces when I have to roll out large areas. Right. So um, it's kind of a mixture. So do you bring, so are you, when you do the, the paint, you're obviously not painting on the concrete or the ground. You're painting on a, you bring something to paint on, like a roll of paper. What, what is it that you paint on? Um, actually, sometimes we do paint directly on the ground. And I've painted uh, festivals in Europe where they do that. And the painting just stays for maybe nine months to a year. And then it washes off over time. Oh, right. People walking on it in weather. But for the short-term projects, I usually bring a, um, a, a vinyl canvas. So I'll bring the vinyl and I'll put that down. It's like a self-adhesive vinyl. And um, it's that, that goes down very quickly and it peels off very quickly. So uh, you can paint directly onto it and have it for your activation or for your festival. And then, you know, when it's over, it's unfortunately like a regular street painting gets taken away. and um, you know, it's got a short lifespan. I actually don't mind that. I like that it's really special for a short mm -hmm. period of time yeah. and that people can enjoy it as it's there. You know, if you're making one out of chalk, it starts disintegrating immediately as soon as you start working on it. So the nature of these pieces is that they're not meant to last very long. So that makes them extra special. Right. That is the magic. That is the magic of, of the art form. Uh, there's a, there's a local school that, um, was kind of inspired by that first street chalk festival years okay. ago in Panama City. It's Southport Elementary School, and they have a street art festival at their school. That's terrific. And, and I've had they, they invited me out for 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 several years. Um, and uh, what they do is they they turn the school, they let the kids loose. Every single kid in that school, they give them a two foot by two foot square. And all the walk areas around the school, they let the kids paint street chalk all day. And then when it's time to pick up the kids, the parents come and they, the grandparents and all that, aunts and uncles, and they walk around the school. And every walkway in the school is, uh, is now this beautiful art festival with all these children's paintings in street chalk. And That's it's, terrific. It's a beautiful wow. thing. Yeah. And the school just every, they've been doing this every year for, my gosh. 15, 20 years at least. And so it is just absolutely phenomenal to see. I'll have to send you some pictures of that. So please do. I would love to see that. Yeah, I think I think it would be uh I'd love to get you out to that one. They would love that. But um <laughs> let's take a look. Talk to me about this now because this isn't easy to do. You have to line everything up, you've got to do perspective. There's there's a there's a technique to making something look 3D on a two-dimensional surface. You know, when you're when you're looking at things like this, that you're interacting with it, and these people are standing on your art, but it looks like they're in an environment. How the heck do you do that? <laughs> and I know you've got a video about it and a book, right? On how to do that. I do. I actually have um, a YouTube channel and I have quite a few tutorials on there now, um, which are how to approach fairly simple 3D images. For instance, like drawing a hole in the ground or drawing a pool, which is very popular. Um, also, I have one for drawing a chair. And if you also watch some of my time lapses, you can see how I do the pieces. Um, but it's, you know, the, the grammar for this uh, art form is based on something called anamorphic projection. And anamorphic projection requires a certain level of uh, distortion for the artwork to work properly. You know, everything is designed to be viewed through the camera lens. Right. So pieces require you to have a, a camera or, or, or like cell, cell phone to take a photo. And because of the way the camera sees uh, the image, um, there's a, there's, there's a, a property that, that occurs where the camera is enlarging what's up front and foreshort uh, foreshortening everything up front and diminishing everything in the distance. So it's like normal perspective, right? As you look in the, into the distance, everything gets smaller. Right. But when you're drawing the, the street painting, you have to enlarge everything in the background 
and reduce everything in the foreground so that when the camera sees it, it equal, equal, equals out. Right. It equals. So um, your, your proportions are correct. So that is um, what's so interesting about this art form is you kind of have to see things in reverse. And once you do that and you trust that, that um, technology, let's say, um, it works beautifully. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a very interesting um, way to make art, to see things in a very distorted way. Now that I've been doing it for so many years, I know exactly you know, how much distortion it needs. I, I constantly check though through my camera to make sure it's correct, but I can kind of freehand things where I think, okay, this, I'm this far out. I need to make this, this big, you know, and um, as I'm painting, I will do that. I will check it and make sure that the scale is correct. Right. Right. Cause um, I, you know, I've seen pictures that you've done where you're sitting with, um, you know, um, a person in your, there's a person in your artwork and you're sitting there with them. And so their feet are really tiny and their head's really big, but it's way over there is what you're saying, basically. Exactly. Like their head could be seven feet long and, you know, very narrow, maybe a foot wide. But in the camera, because of the way uh, perspective works and the way the camera views things, it actually makes it look normal. So um, very interesting science, especially when you walk around the street painting, you can see the level of distortion. That is also a very fascinating way to see the artwork. Right, to walk around it and see the head <laughs> stretch and everything else. You're, you're right. right. I, I've seen that. It is it is pretty amazing stuff. You know, and oh my goodness, you are blowing up the internet with all kinds of great comments. You have got the love is oh. flying on here. Um, <laughs> Thanks. It is great. You've got you've got all kinds of comments. Let's see if we can get one of these up here. Um, oh, here we go. Right here, you know, it says, hi, Tracy Lee Stum. I love your art. It's great. And then we uh -oh. have kinds here. Um, right here, uh, I want to chat about teaching ideas. Your work should be shared with the world. I agree. And that's what we are doing on this show. We are sharing you with the world. So um, I'm working on that. Believe me, I'm, yeah. go I'm going to be sharing it with the world very soon. Oh, good. Now, no, okay. Well, tell us a little bit about what do you have some upcoming projects that you can share with us about about uh, your work? I do, and I'm super excited to um, share this. And I haven't actually shared this with anyone else um, up till this point, so you guys are the first to know the publicly. Exclusive. It's an exclusive <laughs> scoop. Um, I am working on uh, two 3D museums right now, my own museums, which I'm very excited to launch. Oh. And one of them is um, in progress right now in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And uh, that one should be open, I would say, probably early next year, just because we had to shut down due to pandemic, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, and but the other one is going to be starting in a couple of weeks here. I'm going to be going to New Jersey to the oh, I keep losing this thing. Sorry. Um, to the new American Dream Mall, which is um, wow. the same people who own Mall of America. They're built. They built a huge, fabulous entertainment retail complex outside of New York City in East Rutherford, New Jersey. And so I'll be launching a museum there. And our museum is actually called Tilt Tilt 3D Museum. So um, we're going to be showcasing some of the hottest and coolest 3D work there over the next uh, year, I would say. Wow. Um, part of our program is to invite guest artists in to ha give uh, them an exclusive uh, exhibit. And I'm really looking forward to working with my peers and my colleagues and anyone who's into optical illusions for... Um, for this space. So very excited about that. That's going to probably be opening between Thanksgiving and New Year's, I think this year. Wow. Well, congrats. So coming up soon. That is, that is really cool. <laughs> it's, I'm super excited. I can't wait to get there and start painting and, um, you know, hopefully inspire a lot of young people and, and children to engage with this art. I mean, children of all ages. Honestly, you know, eight to 108, come on down and, and have a great time, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, you know, 
that's the thing about street art. It brings out the kid in everybody. It really does. And, and it's, it's hard to, uh, hard to explain if you've never seen it, but when you see it, you're like, Oh, that's fun. And, uh, having had the pleasure of painting and doing it myself with the street chalk, it, it is, it is a blast. It was a little, yeah, bit you know, we never lose it was, that. It was so worth it. It's so much fun. And, uh, we actually have a pastel class here at the encore program. And, uh, so people are learning about pastels and stuff. I wish I could get these people to go outside in the yard, but um, <laughs> out in the parking lot, yeah, draw in the parking lot. But uh, yeah, it would be it would be it would be fun. But be uh, brave, do it. Yes, go, go for the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, let's just go do it. You know, when 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 the uh, campus police arrest us, hey, they'll just arrest me. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Won't be the last either, probably. But. Um, yeah, I know what I mean. It, you know, Tim Gagno and Mischief, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. You know, it's one of those <laughs> things. So, so Tracy, tell us a little bit, um, you know, how did you get started doing this? What was the catalyst that made you go, you know what, I want to do this? Gosh, uh, well, there, you know, it was actually a moment in time when I, I just had this epiphany and said, yeah, that's what I need to be doing. I had been working as a muralist for many years in Los Angeles. And uh, well, let me start at the beginning. I went to art school out of high school. I got a BFA in painting and drawing from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. And um, that's where I first started really playing with pastels. I had taken private art classes when I was a, a, a student um, in school, like middle school and high school. And I took pastel drawing classes. We were drawing still lives and things like that. So I loved pastel because I love drawing. Probably more than painting, I love drawing. So this was a way of drawing with color. So I um, uh, wound up using pastels in college and did a lot of my work with those and just kind of tied that in with my painting practice. Uh, fast forward 10 years or so, I was um, moving to Los Angeles. And you know, out here in California, we have incredible weather for outdoor activities. So I'm, I'm pursuing my career. I'm being a mural painter. I'm doing decorative painting and all kinds of things. I worked in the film industry doing set dressing and things like that. And uh, I just happened to be in Santa Barbara one weekend with a friend and noticed there were all these people converging in front of the mission and it looked like an event was going on. So I said, you know, what's that over there? And he said, oh, that's the Imadinari Festival. And I'm going, what's an Imadinari Festival? And so he said, let's go look. We went over there and I saw, I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw maybe 150 artists drawing these incredibly elaborate reproductions and you know renaissance masterpieces and a variety of other styles of artwork like master artwork on the ground with chalk pastel quite large you know maybe like eight by ten or ten by twelve uh feet in size and so i just wandered around there and couldn't believe what i saw i just freaked out literally and and i said i have to do this this is the coolest thing i've ever seen in my life and so the next year I was, I got in contact with the festival and um, they uh, gave me the instructions on how to join. So I found a sponsor and um, one of the sponsor who uh, um, was interested sponsored me for that coming year. So I, I brought in a sponsor with me and they gave me a small space, an eight by eight. And, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I had drawn on pastel paper for galleries and exhibits and things like that, but I had never drawn on the street. So I was really nervous the first day and super excited, but I realized once I started doing it that I really had a lot of joy and love for the practice. And so I was, I mean, I was just going crazy. I was doing my thing and into it. And I noticed that people started really responding to my artwork. I did an original piece. Um, it was a peacock morphing out of fabric, kind of like an MC Escherish kind of design. And everyone just came by and said, wow, that's great. We love your work. It looks great. And I'm, I'm like going, oh my God, I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> that's, I love this encouragement. It's so great. <laughs> so, so I finished, I had a couple of friends come by and jump in and help me, which was really fun. And I just love the social aspect of 
this festival. You know, I had a guy drawing next to me and a woman drawing next to me on the other side. And so because of that exchange and learning about pastels and what to do when there's too much dust and just looking at other people's artwork, I started becoming friends with all these people. And then they became my family over the course of the next, you know, five or six years. And, um, you know, it was love at first sight, honestly. And, and then after that, I couldn't wait to draw again. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. I, I, I never thought in a million years that I would be drawing on the street as a livelihood, you know, as an art practitioner. It just, it just never occurred to me until I saw this art form. All right. Now, did you dive right in it? I mean, what was your transition, say, from, from doing it as a hobby and then doing it now for a living? Um, how long did it take you to make that transition? Now, you're doing nothing but this. Yeah, that was another one of those aha moments. You know, um, you, they always say you should stay, you know, prepare yourself for what's the opportunities that are coming. And when the opportunity arrives, you seize it, right? So I was kind of primed for that. I was ready. I was waiting. So here I am practicing my art form and going, this is the most fun ever. And back then, I think there were maybe three or four festivals in the United States total. So right. we had to wait for these festivals to, to arrive for us to go draw. So, you know, super excited to go. Oh, my God, next weekend I'm going to this festival. It's, you know, somewhere in Florida. Right. And uh, so um, at one point I had been doing this as a hobby, just like couldn't wait to go on the weekends and do the artwork in and I, I just said, you know, universe, this is really, this was like a prayer to the universe. This is the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. Wouldn't it be great if, seriously ask that question, wouldn't it be great if I could do this full time and make a living doing this or somehow, you know, provide for myself doing this? I just want to do this full time. And it wasn't, I wasn't even really concerned about the security issue. I was just more concerned about that. I love doing this so much. I really just want to do this full time. And then I was, um, at the time I had put up a website and was um, just putting my artwork out there on the internet. And one of uh, my colleagues, another artist from, the, from Europe had put up, uh, he had done a project that went viral on the internet, a uh, uh, chalk drawing that went viral. And that was great for any of us who were ready to do this full time. Because once that went viral, there was a huge interest from all kinds of markets like advertising and right. marketing firms and manufacturing for a new way of engaging with the public. And they, they saw street painting or chalk drawing as a fantastic way to do that. So I started getting calls from people saying, Hey, we want you to come and draw at our event. And you know, the first one I did was for this magazine called cycle world at these uh, motorcycle races up at Laguna Seca. And at the time, I was newly into motor motorcycling, and I was actually motorcycle racing training at that time. And I thought, this is so cool. I get to go to the races. They're going to pay for me to go to the races. Wait. wait, wait. wait. People behind you, <laughs> and they were like, wait a minute. She what? <laughs> she what? So you are training to motorcycle race. So not only does she do street chalk, she is a bad, I can't even say it on the air. You're just a bad motorcycle riding mama. And, and so you are racing motorcycles. Do you still race motorcycles? No, I actually wasn't really racing at that point. I was like, I was taking the track days and I was learning from the, the pros and doing all that stuff to improve my riding, but it was on racetracks. So that was oh, a lot okay. of fun. Okay. But do you still ride motorcycles? Um, I actually don't right now. I sold my bike about three years ago, but I, you know, I rode for 15 years and wow. um, actually uh, another one of my street painting colleagues who used to work with me for many years, Sharon, she's, she was an official racer and won championships. So she was also a street painter slash racer oh, <laughs> more, my so than my, more so than I was. It's a thing for, for, for the, the, the lady street chalk, street art painters to be motorcycle Some of us. people. Yeah, to, yeah. You know, forget just it's one thing to ride a motorcycle. It's another thing to race a motorcycle. You know, it's a little bit different. A little bit different. So that that's yeah. so sorry, fellas. She's married. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild. That is so awesome. So, so that, yeah. we weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting you to say racing motorcycles. That's just 
only on the Modern I, Masters podcast, right? <laughs> right. Like it's just a random. Yeah, I, I have a lot of those random things in my life. So who knows what else is going to come up? But um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, when you find something you love to do, you just got to do it. And that's my philosophy in life. So motorcycling was one of those. It was actually it was my my therapy at the time, you know. Everybody needs a little therapy periodically. And I'm telling you, riding a motorcycle at speed will clear your brain like nothing else. Oh, yeah. And- <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. Yeah, that is absolutely the truth. So that is awesome. So that was your first like client, though, was this was this company that wanted you to come up and paint something for their for their for their festival. So, for the races, for the for the World Superbike races, yeah. So we went there, and I mean, I was just surprised and excited that they were gonna, you know, pay my way, like pay for my my travel and my hotel. And I mean, I was I was just like, oh my god, I get to draw, them and they're gonna give me the perks of the of the event. This is great. Right. So then, you know, I wasn't really concerned about making a living, let's say. But um, slowly over time, I started getting more and more projects, and then I started traveling internationally. You know, getting invited to come to uh, Korea and Japan to draw, um, to make these street paintings. So it quickly became a source of income for me. And it was enough for me to actually stop mural painting. I I basically said, you know, I don't want to do mural painting anymore. I want to just do this, which was drawing on the ground with chalk pastel. Right. And, um, you know, it, I, I kind of just followed my heart, honestly. Whatever felt good for me and felt resonant with me. Mm-hmm. That's always been my guide in my life. Yeah, and it's a it, and it, thing when you can. It paint, worked out. You can do for a living what you're passionate about. There's nothing right. like in the world, you know. It really, it really isn't, and it's a rare thing for people to do that. Most people hate their jobs, you know. And, yeah, and that's, you can when you can be someone that does what you love. It's a totally different ball game, and, and you know, you know, and if I not, I feel very lucky that, that way. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm grateful every day for it. It's um, It's been just um, an exciting adventure. And, you know, as I get older, I don't do as many as I used to because, I mean, really, I call it a young man's sport. It is very physical. And even though I keep myself in good shape, it, it's very taxing on the body. So when I do get a chance to go out and do a project, for instance, I, I just completed a very large um, street painting mural project in Eufaula, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. and um, it was in their downtown uh, section. Uh, they have a little intersection downtown, very small, small town in Oklahoma. And there was an, uh, an old restaurant that had burned down. So there's an empty lot there. And the organization who had me out there, um, Vision Ufala, um, they actually vision, envisioned this becoming something for the public. So they wanted to put a piece of art there. And one of the directors of the organization, Karen Weldon, actually um, called me up one day and you know, she sent me an email and said, Hey, I'm looking to do a 3d street painting here. Would you be interested? And I took a look at the space and I said, yeah, this looks great. So I just went out there and completed a mural. It's a permanent piece and it's going to be something for the public there. So when I was painting there, I was so excited to be back with the brush, you know, back doing my thing. And, um, I, I still have the love for that practice. It just never goes away. And you're always learning something new. You're always pushing yourself. You're, for me, I like to experiment in my work a lot. So I try yeah. new techniques when I'm working and that keeps it fresh and exciting for me, no mm. matter how many of these I've done. Right. Now yeah. on your website, you've got, you've got some interesting uh, information. Um, one of the first things it said that 70% of your business is overseas where you're, where you're traveling overseas to do, to do your artwork. That was very interesting. So you are quite the world traveler. So what, what has been, what, what was your, like, your, your moment of, oh my gosh, I'm painting here. What, what country was that that made you just lose your mind with like, whoa, it's happening? Uh, well, I mean, any, the, any of the foreign trips at, you know, when I first, before I started doing this professionally, I was actually able to go to some foreign festivals Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, one of the, well, there are several that stand out, but um, the first one was the a festival in Italy, Grazie, de Curtitone. It's the International Imadinari Festival. And, 
you know, I went over there with my girlfriend and my sister and her husband and a couple of friends. Like we had this big group that showed up there to, to just kind of come and experience it and, and have fun. And my girlfriend and I were painting together. And when we got there, it's a 24 hour festival. And so you start at 6 p.m. and you finish 6 p.m. the next day. Oof. And, uh, you know, I remember like being there in this environment, you know, every place has a unique um, signature, right? It smells a certain way. It looks a certain way. It feels a certain way, the atmosphere. Right. So I, I go to this plaza and I'm standing there looking around and there's all these international artists from all over Europe and, and the U.S. drawing and I'm, I'm going, I'm in Italy painting on the street with all these amazing artists. Like <laughs> this is just the best thing ever. And so that was a that was a moment for me. And I just savored every single second of that experience of those 24 hours. And then, you know, another time was when I I went to um Korea to street paint. And I was by myself and I had been commissioned by um, a company there. It was in the winter time, which was crazy because it's cold and it was snowing. And they had me under a tent outside and I'm drawing on the street going, okay, I'm in Asia drawing. This is a wild experience. <laughs> the, you know, it's a new language, it's new food, it's new culture, it's new everything. And the people across the board have always been so gracious and so lovely. And I just, for me to make friends with people from other countries was just the biggest thrill of my life. So I really enjoyed those moments and savored every single second. Awesome. Yeah. Art, art has the ability, you know, it's a universal language. It doesn't matter the culture. It doesn't matter the language. Doesn't matter the era. Art has a way of bringing people together and it's a beautiful thing. Um, now, yeah. you have all kinds of other things on your website that's pretty neat. You've got a ton of videos. You've got uh, some um, downloadable things like a recipe of how to make your own pastel chalk. Oh, that's cool. How to make your own pastel chalk. So, so if you guys are watching, make sure that you go to tracyleestum.com. There's a ton of stuff on there. If you're watching this online and, and those of you that are in the class here taking good notes, but um, Tracy, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Uh, it has been a pleasure. I'm so glad that we got to catch up. It's been too long. It we has been. Definitely uh, hang out and talk a little bit. And um, soon we need to do that. But um, again, thank you for coming on. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye to the audience. Stay on the line. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit after, after the show. And I just wanted to mention one more thing for your audience that I do have a book out, it's called The Art of Chalk. It was published in 2016, and that is chock full of information, technical information, practical information on how to do 3D street painting. And, and it- um, it on your website? It, it, it's, it includes, uh, it should be on my, it's on my website, it should be on the homepage on one of the banners. Okay, um, right. It's published by uh, Quarto Publishing. So just look up The Art of Chalk, it's, it's available on online retailers and there are over 50 of my friends and colleagues and other artists um, doing all kinds of chalkboard drawing, pastel drawing, and street painting. So do check it out. And if you're if somebody who wants to practice, it's a great guide for you. Excellent. We are, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go buy a book today, guys. That's what I, I know what I'm doing today. I'm gonna get in trouble with my wife. I'm gonna buy a book. I'm gonna spend some money. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure and just so terrific to, re to, to catch up and reconnect. Well, we've got one question for you. Say it again. Did, when she goes on an international job, mm -hmm. does she bring her supplies with her? Yeah. The question was, when you go international, do you bring your supplies with you or do you get them there? Or do you ship it's them? What do you do? Uh, yeah. It depends on where I'm going and what I can get. Like if I'm going to Europe, I uh, usually can get the supplies there if I'm using paint or chalk. But if I'm um, street painting in India, for instance, which I've painted at many times, I usually take all my supplies with me. So uh, they don't have um, the materials that I need there or it's very mm. hard to get them. So I just take it as extra baggage on the plane and it's a lot less expensive than shipping. Oh, wow. That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, traveling with art supplies is always an adventure. It's always right? <laughs> especially cases and cases of chalk. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, my plein air kit, my plein air kit, I used to put my brushes, you know, you want to protect your paintbrushes. And so I put, not thinking, like I normally it's in my backpack. I have a, I have a hiking backpack with my plein air kit in there. And to protect my brushes, I have a PVC pipe about this long and I take the cap off and I put the brush in, put the cap on. Well, I took it on a plane and little did I know that that looks exactly like a pipe bomb. Oh gosh. <laughs> and so when I'm going, when my plein air kit is going through the x-ray machine, I see the lady's eyes go boom. Right. <laughs> she pulls it aside all of a sudden I'm standing there and I'm thinking, you know, oh, it was a bad day. And I'm like, it's paintbrushes, I promise. And she's like, she's looking at me like, and then she pulls it out, she opens it up. Yeah, I was in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> so traveling with art supplies, don't put it in a PVC pipe. That's, right. that's my you advice. Have, you could have a, a podcast just about that because oh, yeah. we all have stories. Oh yeah, all all of the things you shouldn't do with art supplies. <laughs> well, Tracy, again, thank you for coming on. It was a pleasure. I'm so glad we had this talk. And so, again, stay on the line. I'm going to chat with you in just a moment. I'm going to say goodbye uh, to our audience. So, thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Bye. Bye bye. Well, everybody, wasn't that a great show? Oh, my gosh, that was great, wasn't it? Wasn't that great? That was a great show. Uh, Tracy is just absolutely a peach. She is wonderful. I'm so glad that we have her on. Uh, next week, next week, we have a really, really neat artist coming on the show. Uh, we have a young lady named Emily Willoughby. Now, Emily Willoughby is a paleo artist. This is, a, this is an artist that works with paleontologists. Um, and when they, when they find a new dinosaur or say a woolly mammoth or, 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 or a, uh, an extinct animal of any kind, really. And you know, what do they look like? All we have is bones. So paleo artists work with paleontologists to paint and draw these and these extinct animals. And, and her niche, if you will, is she, paints the feathered dinosaurs. Um, all of the new, you know, one of the things they found about the uh, carnivore, carnivorous theropod dinosaurs uh, is that they were very bird-like to include, we now know, being completely covered in feathers. And so she paints these bird-like dinosaurs uh, in just amazing ways. So she's going to be coming on and talking to us and sharing her art uh, next week. So that's going to be, I'm geeking out just a little bit. I got to be honest. I got to be honest. I'm geeking out. Not a little bit. Okay. A little, it's a lot. I, you know, it's a lot. So, but uh, anyway, guys, uh, that's coming up. And so uh, be sure to tune in next week at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, with that said, guys, just remember, uh, I'm your old pal, Tim. God loves you, and so do I. We'll talk to you next time. Yay.